Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to our Grow Wet Project Q&A webinar. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening and it's great to see so many people that I recognise here and obviously as well people who I don't. Um, thank you to those of you who have already registered as Grow Wet Volunteer and for those of you who haven't, hopefully this evening will persuade you to sign up afterwards. So my name is Lizzie Every, and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the project and I'm now going to pass you on to Andy for the housekeeping. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Lo lovely to see so many people here. Uh, we're all really excited about this project, so it's great to see other people are too. Um, just to go over a little bit of housekeeping, um, you'll be used to this by now by, from using Zoom. Um, we are recording this, as Lizzie mentioned, so um, uh, just so that we can share that with other people who were not able to attend tonight. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please use the question Q&A box at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and we'll save the questions up and answer them all together towards the end. We've got about half an hour for that. Um, we've also got, uh, we're going to be doing a few polls. So you will see something pop up on your screen. You might wonder what it is, but it would just, it's just a little bit of trivia um, just to, to keep your interest. Uh, and hopefully it's a little bit educational for you too. And you can test your knowledge of freshwater habitats. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> so now I'm going to give you a quick overview of what you guys can expect in the webinar this evening. So to start with, um, Andy and I are going to give you a very quick introduction to Building Oxfordshire's Freshwater Network, and then we'll have our first poll. Um, and then after the poll, the Freshwater Habitats, well, our Freshwater Habitats Trust director, Jeremy, will talk to you about um, Freshwater Habitats Trust as a charity and then go into more detail about building Oxfordshire's freshwater network and the importance of your role as um, Grow, Grow Wet volunteers. Um, after that, we will then have our second poll. <laughs> and um, after our second poll, David, Freshwater Habitats Trust, um, plants, sorry, Senior Plant Ecologist and Project Director, will then introduce you to some of the amazing wetland plants that you might be growing in as a Grow Wet volunteer. Um, then it'll be time for our third and final poll before handing you over to our lovely Freshwater Futures trainees who will talk to you about your grow packs and what you can expect to receive in them. Uh, finally, we shall open the floor to all of you and your questions and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, if not, then we'll be able to answer them hopefully after the webinar um, via email or via another method, maybe through Eventbrite. Um, I'm now going to yeah, give you a really quick overview of um, building Oxfordshire's freshwater network um, and so yeah kick off this webinar. So this project started in September last year and is going to run until March um, the following year, however we're really really hoping that this pro um, project will continue for much much longer and possibly eventually spread to at least neighbouring counties if not hopefully nationwide. Um, <clears throat> we uh, sorry, um, it's funded through the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, which is an amazing fund that is um, supporting natural or nature projects around England with the aim to kickstart environmental renewal and create and retain a range of jobs around England. So that's really, really cool. Um, and we're very lucky to have this um, funded funding our project. Um, we also have so many amazing project partners that Andy is going to chat to you about now. Well, thanks, Lizzie. So, yeah, we're working with uh, the National Trust. So we've got uh, we're doing some uh, floodplain restoration work there and also um, pond creation uh, at the Coles Hill Estate, which is just on the Wiltshire border. Uh, we're also working a key partner is the Oxford Botanic Garden. So they're currently propagating all of your lovely plants uh, before uh, we'll be sending them out to you in May and June. Uh, we're working with an organisation called People in Action, who um, uh, do horticultural therapy with groups around Oxford. Uh, they're based at Cutterslow Park, um, and they'll be one of our growing hubs. Uh, we're working with the River Tame Conservation Trust. So again, they're, they're doing some uh, uh, creating wetlands in floodplains in the Tame catchment. Uh, we're working with the Thames Valley Wildflower Restoration Project, um, and they're doing grassland restoration. Uh, and quite a lot of events. It's worth look, looking out for those, actually. We'll link those to our events as well. Um, and then another key partner is Thames Water. So we're predominantly working at the Farmore Reservoir, so creating some new ponds there. Um, some of you may have been there before and might know Pink Hill. So we'll be doing it in the, in the spirit of the previous work that we've done with Thames Water. So just to 
just to give an overview of how the, the building Oxfordshire's freshwater network project is divided. Um, we've got three main programmes that, that we're working on. So the first one is all about restoring and creating uh, uh, um, existing special habitats. Um, and yeah, I mean, these are, these are nationally important as well as locally important. It's all about spreading the word about that really and getting people involved in, in, in doing that. The second aspect is, is Grow Wet, which we're all here for tonight. Uh, so that really is about harnessing the power of community to grow some of Oxford, Oxfordshire's most endangered plants in the community. So yeah, you guys will all be doing that for us. Uh, so we're, we're very excited about that. And then last but not least, um, we've got a programme called Freshwater Futures. Um, our trainees uh, are with us this evening. So Evie, Paula and Ellie. And they'll be talking to you a little bit later. And that's um, part of the Green Recovery Challenge Fund, as Lizzie said, it's all about ensuring there is um, employment in, in the sector and that people have the skills to, to take on these challenges as we move forward. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> so now we're going to do one of our um, polls, our first poll, before passing you along to Jeremy, the Freshwater Habitats Trust Director. Um, I will share it with you now. Okay, I think I'll end the poll there and I'll show you the results. <clears throat> so hopefully you should all be able to see what the final results were for that one. Oh, um, it, interesting, isn't it, that nobody went for 85%. I know. Um, you'd be quite right. Uh, yeah, so the actual answer is uh, approximately 20% of ponds are um, clean, basically. So, so we know this by... We, we do quite a lot of water quality testing um, and we're really all about creating clean water for wildlife. Uh, wildlife thrives best in, in clean water, basically. So that's the reason for that one. But it looks like most of you knew that. So <clears throat> thanks very much. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll now uh, pass over to Jeremy Biggs, who is uh, the director of Freshwater Habitats Trust. And he's going to be telling us a bit more about uh, the, the trust and also the Freshwater Network. Thank you very much, Andy. I will just do the screen sharing. Just bear with me for a moment while we get going. OK, is that looking OK? I've got a nice screen view there, have I? Yeah, good. OK. Yeah, we're good. Thank you both. You can all hear me all right? My, my, uh, my... No, I'm not muted. No, that's good. No, you're sounding loud good. and good. Right? Excellent. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Andy, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Lovely to see you all tonight, or virtually see you. Um, thank you for coming along. It's really appreciated. Um, as I expect... Uh, oh, what's happening here? Was it not going forward? Oh, there we are. It's going forward now. Good. Um, as I expect, many of you will already know, uh, Freshwater Habitats Trust is a wildlife conservation charity based here in Oxford that works to protect life in freshwater, that, that is freshwater biodiversity. We've been around for 30 years or so and work all over Britain, but Oxford is one of our core areas, um, not just because it's the place where we started, but because Oxfordshire itself is an important area for its freshwater wildlife, as we'll sh I'll show you a few pictures in a moment about that. As an organisation, we do policy and research and practical conservation projects, which have a strong science and evidence base. And that's all for the protection of freshwater biodiversity. Okay. Um, the reason we do it, I guess, is because we all love freshwater wildlife but also it's because freshwaters are probably the most threatened part of the natural world. And freshwater wildlife is declining worldwide and also here in Oxfordshire. And it's because of these threats that we are creating the freshwater network. This is our practical plan to protect life in freshwater. And that's really what the overall Grow Wet or the overall Building Oxfordshire's Freshwater Network project is all about. And that's what Grow Wet is part of. It's about creating a network of habitats to protect the best freshwaters and wetlands so they stay in good condition 
and to build out from those areas to create new clean water habitats, both standing and running water, to make the floodplains of this area wilder and wetter, like we've been doing here on the restored floodplain of the River Thames at, at Pink Hill Meadow, and to be getting into better condition, uh, neglected wetlands like these, these over, this overgrown fen at Chillswell Valley, just west of Oxford, and doing this so that the threatened freshwater plants and animals of the area not only stop declining, but can spread back into the landscape. Now the freshwater network will comprise all kinds of freshwaters and wetlands, small and large, and those smaller habitats are especially important. So ponds like this one out on Otmore to the east of Oxford, uh, even tiny little pools like this. This looks like nothing at all, doesn't it? These are temporary pools in a green lane on the edge, just five or six miles from Oxford. These are the habitat of one of Britain's most endangered water plants, tassel stonewort. So these tiny patches are really important. We're talking about, oh, small streams, which shouldn't be displaying like that. It's gone sideways. Sorry about that, folks. You'll have to turn your head sideways and you can see that's a small headwater stream uh, in, uh, in a wood near Radley in Oxford, near, near Oxford. And it includes patches of fenland, small patches of fenland like this. This is a place that we've been working called Western Fen. And other wetlands like uh, this uh, rich meadow at Hinksy Meads. Now, this is one of those special MG4 grasslands, much beloved of botanists, one of the richest kinds of grassland habitats and a, and a floodplain speciality. And as well as these, oh, and lovely places like this, here's a bit more of the floodplain of Otmore. This, you can see an old river channel here. This is a former river channel now gradually filling in and creating ponds, a characteristic feature of many floodplains in southern England and especially of this area. Now, these are all relatively small habitats, but we're also talking, of course, about the bigger, obvious rivers and lakes that we tend to think of first when we talk about freshwaters. It's both the large and the small that's important here, though. And I'm showing you particularly a part of the River Thames here, which is obviously very prominent in Oxfordshire. You'll know some of you, I'm sure, that the Thames is severely impacted by pollution uh, from sewage, from agricultural runoff. But despite that, uh, there are still special things living in the river. And th at this particular exact location, I'm not showing you a, a, a rather urbanised looking part of the uh, built up part of the River Thames here for, for, for any, uh, for no good reason. This is a place where the dragonfly that you can see in the top of the screen, the club-tailed dragonfly, actually lives and emerges on that metal sheet piling to come out of the river to begin its adult life. So even though this river is, is pretty impacted, it's still got some special things living in it. Um, now, Oxfordshire as a whole is, as I say, a special place for freshwater wildlife. It's one of the top 25 or so areas for freshwater biodiversity in England and Wales. It's a map that we've recently created, which shows these important areas across the country as a whole for the first time. And you can see uh, places that you'll be well, you'll, you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, the Lake District that's right up in the northwest there, number two on the map, and number 12, the uh, Norfolk and Suffolk Broads, again, a famous part of the country. 23, the New Forest, these are all famous places for their wildlife, including their fresh waters. But there amongst them is the Oxford area, number 17, one of the best places for freshwater wildlife in the country. Um, a particularly important part of that freshwater diversity in the Oxford area is its water plants. Now, water plants are a vital part of all healthy fresh waters. And many which would, would once have been traditionally much more abundant and widely distributed uh, than they are now are found in the Oxford area uh, and are struggling. They're, they're much rarer than they once were. And in fact, uh, plants like water violet, um, bladderwort, fen pondweed, the opposite leaf pondweed, these are all plants which are now found only a in a handful of places in the Oxford area uh, and are declining all over Britain as a whole. In fact, I could show you 25 or 30 different species like this, which are all declining, all threatened or vulnerable to more or less complete extinction in this area. Some so much that they have already gone extinct. So uh, this plant, uh, the long stalked pondweed, when we first came to Oxfordshire, uh, we could still find this living in ponds and in the river, the main river Thames. But now, uh, 25 years on, this has as far as we can tell, gone completely extinct in Oxfordshire. So this is really the, the sharp end of nature conservation, species which are still disappearing from the landscape. And the reason they've gone, in this case of the plants, is mainly because of water pollution, uh, especially excessive nutrients, whether that's from 
uh, sewage works or from runoff from farmland or from urban areas. Though the loss of habitat hasn't helped as well. That's been going on for a very long time. Uh, and this is one of my favorites. This is frog bit. A little, looks a bit like a miniature water lily. This should be common all down the Thames Valley growing in the, the ponds and, and pools of floodplains and even in the rivers themselves. This is just about now in Oxfordshire hanging on uh, in, the, in the Otmore area. Now, building Oxfordshire's freshwater network is an important project because it's really the first large practical trial of the whole freshwater network concept. Um, starting here in Oxfordshire, but as uh, Lizzie said, this is an approach that we, we expect to see developing over all of the country in due course. And in this first stage of the project, we're creating particularly new habitats on floodplains to get them closer to their natural condition. For example, by making ponds like these, here are some more Pink Hill Meadows ponds where we've been doing this, this kind of work for, for quite a few years now. We're extending, we're trying to extend that special kind of floodplain grass and restoring it from these rather dull and intensive agricultural versions of the habitat. This is the floodplain uh, as it used to look uh, alongside the Thames, north of Whiteham, uh, Whiteham Woods, where one of our colleagues, Alison MacDonald, over the years has been working to restore the diversity of that floodplain grass. And so that by 2015, beginning back in the 80s, after 20 years or so, she'd managed to get that such a, that, that habitat into such good condition that the first fritillaries, fritillaries, one of the special plants of the floodplains around here, were beginning to recolonize. So those are the kind of, uh, and we're also, uh, sorry, I should say, we're also bringing neglected fens, wetlands like this, this patch at Hinksy Heights Fen, where we've already started some work. We're bringing these back into management so that they're, uh, the, the low growing vegetation, the, the plants and animals are not smothered by extensive growths of dense growths of reeds that you can see growing in the background of this picture. Reeds are a great thing in the right place, but in these fens, it's, it really does reduce their interest for wildlife. And we're working with a number of these to uh, bring these back into better condition. So those are the, uh, those are the kind of habitat components of the project of the Building Oxfordshire's Freshwater Network project. But of course, Grow Wet is also a big part of this work uh, where we're helping the rare water and wetland plants of the area to get back into, to, to, to recover their status, to spread back into landscapes that they've disappeared from um, so that we can help them spread back into the new high quality habitats that we've either created or restored. Now, nature would have once done this work for us. So the wind, the floodwaters, birds, mammals, these would have spread seeds and fragments of water plants around the landscape. And, and these days, often it's livestock like these that are helping us to do that. Um, but the places where these plants grow now are so, are so far apart from each other and the good quality locations that these plants need, uh, there's almost no chance that with the wind, the water, or birds and mammals that they can get to these new locations as they, and these plants do need to be able to spread around the landscape to survive. And that's what Grow Wet is going to be kickstarting, helping that process along um, until we can hopefully get the plants back into a situation where they can look after themselves again. And as you've heard, we're already, we're beginning to grow on the seedling plants for this work to so that before we get them, before we start um, fostering them out to you. So here's a tray of fen violets growing in the Oxford Botanic Gardens. This is one of Britain's, actually one of Britain's rarest water plants as a, a small population in the Oxford area. So we'll be able to get these out to you, you'll be able to grow them on, and then we'll take them back to appropriate locations where we expect they'll be able to survive in the long term. Um, in doing this, um, we're going to be taking part in really a big experiment because Grow Wet is the first time anyone has really taken this kind of approach, taken a whole set of declining water and wetland plants and tried to grow them on like this and then move them back into the wild on a large scale. So this is a really novel project. It's really a, a, first, a first time that been, this has been done in a big way. And we're pretty sure that this will be of great interest to people well beyond Oxfordshire because it's something that probably needs to be repeated very widely across the whole of England. So um, we're really pleased to be getting this going. We've been wanting to do this work for a long time and we're tremendously grateful for your support and interest in what we think is a really important piece of conservation work, which we think will be helping some of Britain's most threatened wildlife to recover 
and persists in our landscapes and simply not to disappear from the countryside as a whole. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to hand you back now to Lizzie. I think we're going to have another poll, aren't we? And um, we'll carry on with the rest of the workshop. That's great. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. Um, yes, we are going to have another poll now, so I will get that up on the screen for you. OK, great. Thanks, guys. OK, so here are the results from the panel. And yeah, actually, it seems like you guys are absolutely right. Yeah, there are 12 um, carnivorous plants that are native to the UK. So talking about well plants. Done. Yeah, well <laughs> done, everyone. Um, so 12 native to the UK and three uh, are in Oxfordshire. So I'll just post those in the chat so you know what they are. Thanks, Andy. OK, and while Andy's doing that, I will pass you on to David to talk to you a little bit about the plants that you guys might be growing for or as a grow at volunteer. Thanks very much, Lizzie. Share my screen. That one. Right. OK, well, thanks, Jeremy, for so comprehensively setting the scene there. That's great. So as Jeremy said, the Oxford area is a very important area for freshwater wildlife in general, but especially plants. And I'm going to give a brief introduction to just two of the plant species that are important locally and that we're propagating in this grow wet element of the Building Ox Threshold Network project. And the full list of plants that we're working on and that you might potentially be able to grow will be on, are on the project website, which will be dropped into the chat at some point during the webinar. So the first species I'm going to talk to you about is the greater water parsnip or Cyan latifolium in Latin. So there it is on the screen. So the English name is not a very inspired name for what is a really very beautiful plant of very high quality wetland landscapes. However, as the English name does suggest, though you can't be too careful with these English names, is that it's related to parsnips. So it is an umbellifer. So it's in the same botanical family as carrot and cow parsley. And you can see in the pictures there that it has uh, this sort of umbrella shaped head of small white flowers, just like the cow parsley that's coming to flower along the local road verges. And also, as the English name suggests there, it is great. It's a big plant and it does grow to about two meters or so. Um, and in the wild, you can find greater water parsnip living in very wet places in the sort of tall vegetation that you can find along the margins of lowland rivers, ponds and lakes and also in ditches, growing with other tall wetland species such as the grass common reed and flowers like meadowsweet and purple loosestrife. And uh, it can grow in submerged, submerged in shallow water, but not too deep as it needs to be rooted and the seeds don't germinate underwater. It doesn't like shade. It also doesn't like being eaten, understandably. Although the roots are actually poisonous, the foliage isn't quite so toxic and livestock and other herbivores will eat it if they can get at it. So, like a lot of water plants, the leaves that grow in or closest to the water are beautifully dissected frilly things and you can see that in that bottom left image there the, the leaf at the bottom is a sort of frilly thing hopefully you can see that uh, contrasting with the aerial leaf the uh, much simpler looking thing above it there uh, and these yeah these frilly leaves are much different and quite distinctive to this species there are a couple of similar looking aquatic or wetland plants um, that have these simple sort of parsnip like undivided leaves but they lack those frillier leaves yeah so that's greater water parsnip that's what it looks like and so in our area um yeah so i said as i said before it's a very special plant of wetland landscapes and historically it was widespread in the wetlands of the thames valley and as late as the 1920s it could still be said i really like this quote uh, that the ditches about oxford yield an abundance of this handsome and conspicuous plant and it was locally common all along the Thames from as far as Ensham down to Reading. It was also in parts of the Charwell catchment and at Otmore. Now, it's still a very handsome plant. It's still the same species, but conspicuous, it really isn't. And you can walk all the way along the Thames path and never see it. Because sadly, at some point in recent history, the population of this species has completely collapsed. And its remains are just two tiny relic sites in the floodplains near the city of Oxford. And also, sadly, this decline is not peculiar to our area in the Upper Thames, and this decline has been mirrored across Britain with this species disappearing across its range 
and it's now categorized as an endangered species. And we think this collapse is a result of several factors, including, as Jeremy mentioned, the usual suspects of pollution of the water environment, but also perhaps management of river levels for navigation and flood relief. And also importantly, the change in management of ditches and ponds to either more intensive management or complete neglect uh, compared with traditional methods. And the effects of land management particularly important as most of our flora lives in what you might call a Goldilocks zone, where the level of disturbance is just right, too little disturbance and trees invade and outcompete most wetland plants for light, too much disturbance and most plants can't regenerate. And being essentially a plant of narrow wet edges, this very narrow zone where it can exist, um, greater water parsnip is particularly vulnerable to these changes. Uh, so, so recognizing the parlous state of the local population of greater water parsnip, over the last two to three years, uh, greater water parsnip has been a real key focus of Freshwater Habitats Trust's projects in, our, in this area. Um, as well as carrying out habitat restoration, its two remaining sites, we've learned a lot about the needs of the species through ex situ conservation work with our partners at Oxford Botanic Garden. And the garden has developed a large population of the species in cultivation and working with local botanist Judy Webb and many other volunteers, we've been planting these into new locations to try to understand better what it needs to thrive and to replenish the local population. And in the images here on this slide, you can see some plants in cultivation at the Botanic Garden there in the frames and then being planted out by volunteers. That's at Cutslow on the floodplain of the River Charwell. And you can see a thriving plant in full flower at uh, Millen Ford Nature Park in New Marston in uh, East Oxford. Uh, that's, I was there yesterday, it's still there. It's doing very well, you can go to see it there. So um, in conclusion, Great Water Parsnip is a plant we know quite a lot about at Freshwater Habitats Trust. And this project, Grow Wet, is enabling us to increase the numbers of plants that we have in cultivation and ultimately the wild, as well as be able to tell more people about how important this plant is and involve local people in restoring it, something like its former glory. That's my first species. Um, and if you get a, if you get greater water pasta in your Grow Wet pack, it'll probably come in a pot of compost. Um, and for my second species, I wanted to talk about a plant, uh, an aquatic plant that we're working on in the project and that we'd be distributing in containers of water. And Jeremy actually already mentioned this species. Um, it's the water violet, Hetonia palustris, which is a very attractive plant, which I chose because it's just starting to come out into flower now. And as we get into May, it'll be putting on fantastic displays at places like Otmore, especially Otmore, to the east of Oxford. And this is where the photo behind us all was taken. So water violet. Um, now I warned you earlier about English names and how they can be misleading, and this is a good example of a misleading one because vi water violet is not a violet, it is in fact a primrose, and the photo of the flower on the slide there does indeed look like a miniature primrose, it's, it's got five petals with a little sort of eye in the middle, and you can see the five anthers in the middle arranged around the little sort of pin-like style there. And um, yeah, when it flowers in May, long spikes of these beautiful little things emerge above the water. And the rest of the plant lives submerged as just floating stems and leaves. And the leaves are a very vivid green color. I think those pictures there give you a good idea of how vivid the color of the leaves are. And they're arranged in whirls around the stem of four or five individual leaves coming out of the same point. And like the submerged leaves of the greater water parsnip that I showed you before, they also have a sort of feathery appearance with each leaf consisting of numerous filaments arranged sort of like a ladder up the central axis. Okay, so again, just like, water, just like greater water parsnip, water violet is another declining species. It lives in ponds or very flow, slow flowing streams and needs clean open water. It doesn't, very, it doesn't survive very long in shade or dirty water. So it's susceptible to the same sorts of pressures that have done in the greater water parsnip, though water violet, fortunately, remains more widespread locally and nationally. We've got a lot more than two places where it still is, although Otmore is really the best place to see it. Um, one attribute of this species that does help it partly to deal with this kind of pressure is that seeds are able to live in a dormant state for a long time, buried in waterlogged sediment. So if a water violet pond becomes overgrown with trees, or other tall vegetation and the adult plants disappear, there's a hope that it will re-emerge from buried seed when a pond is restored, 
and indeed um, this species did benefit incidentally from some work that we did recently to restore the habitat of greater water parsnip with some ditch work that we were doing, clearing trees to open up uh, the site for greater water parsnip, trigger the germination of buried water violet seed. So that was a win-win there. Um, but despite this, this hope, um, water violet has retreated from many, many parts of the county due to pollution and the decline of traditional land use practices. And its populations are now very small mostly, and they're very fragmented with little opportunity for plants to move around, find that crucial clean water and regain some of its lost range. And as Jeremy was saying, that's why your participation in Grow It is so important, helping us to restore this charismatic aquatic plant to Oxfordshire's wetlands. That's, that's, that's me. Great, thank you very much, David. Okay, so hopefully you've got, you guys have got a slightly better idea of how your plants can be growing. So some of them will be in buckets in aquatic and submerged in water, and a lot of them will come in pots as well, like your average house plant, unfortunately. So that's something for you guys to know. I'm gonna quickly share our next poll now. Um, and hopefully, this one's on freshwater habitats. So let's see what you think about this question. So I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you very much. And here are the results. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, OK, well, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? So um, it is actually about 10 percent um, of the, the total proportion in the country. So, I mean, if you think about that, it's actually quite a large proportion. Um, so we are kind of custodians for, for quite a large area of um pretty unusual habitat that you're not going to find that many other places. Um, we're working on six calcareous, um, sorry, alkaline fens uh, as part of this project. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out, go and visit one near to you. Um, there's there's a lot of them about. Do get in touch if you want, want to know where to go. The real answer, of course, is that we don't really know how much there is. And part of the aim of, one of the aims of the project is to assess properly how much we actually have and how much we could potentially have in Oxfordshire. Adam said to visit Rally Park, which is a really yeah, lovely place to visit for friends. Good shout, right? Okay, thank you. So now I'm going to pass you on to our lovely Freshwater Futures trainees, Paula, Evie and Ellie, to chat to you about the grow packs. So I will share my screen for you guys. And then I'll skip to, there we go. Can you all see that okay? Yeah, we can see that. Thank oh, you, yeah. Lizzie. All right. Thanks, Lizzie. So hi, everybody. As Lizzie just said, um, we're briefly going to tell you what you can expect from your grow work packs if you do choose to volunteer with us, which I hope you will. Um, so you will receive a pack to either help you um, grow a plant from seed um, to support the growth of the seedling to care for an adult plant or to care for a fully aquatic plant. Um, so each pack um, will be provided in a cardboard box with everything you need to care for your plant. Um, so the packs will contain some compost, a saucer, a pot and a couple of labels. And this will be for the care of your seedling and adult plant with the addition of a plug tray if you get some seeds. Um, for fully aquatic plants, we will supply a watertight container for you. Um, all plants will also contain growing instructions and we will support you throughout as well. If you have any questions, you can always get in contact with us if something's not clear. Um, some freshwater habitat merchandise will also be in there and a plant diary for you to fill in as your plant grows. So these plant diaries will be very helpful for us to determine the best conditions in which these plants grow. Um, a lot of these plants haven't been grown in certain of home conditions so it'll be really interesting to see how they thrive um, and because of this we really appreciate it if you could take the time to fill them out um, and there will be some guidance questions in those diaries as well so you know what kind of information that we're after um, that's all from me and logistics um, Ellie is going to take over yep thanks Evie, Evie. Um, so once we've put the packs together we will then be distributing them in late May and early June. 
And during this time, we'll be organising drop-offs directly to people's houses to make sure that everyone can receive their plant um, if this works best for you. But we are also organising some distribution hubs um, around Oxfordshire where people from the local area of that specific hub will then be able to go and collect their plant pack and then take it home with them. And so far we have three confirmed hubs. One is at South Oxford Community Centre, one's at Florence Park Community Centre, and the other one is at Bridge Street Community Gardens, which is in Banbury. Um, so we'll be sending out more information regarding distribution in the next month or so. So if you keep an eye on your emails and our social media posts, um, for more details about all of this distribution and further confirmed hubs. And finally, we thought it would be useful to note that as well as the equipment that comes with your packs, we are also able to provide spare pots and any compost at a later date um, if anything breaks or you need, you need spares. Um, so that's it for logistics. And now over to Paola to talk about our upcoming events and social media. Thanks, Ellie. Um, so finally, we are also very excited to offer an amazing events program um, that will include art sessions, family open days, community events, botanical walks, and many other um, very interesting activities all over Oxfordshire. Um, so for instance, this very Saturday, we will be at Florence Park Community Centre from 12 p.m. and also at Boundary Brook Nature Park from 2 p.m. So, if you're around, please come along and say hello to us. We'll be really glad to see you all. Um, well, in fact, on the slide on the screen and also in the chat, we will be providing you just now with links to our Facebook and Instagram. So please take a second to click on them and subscribe. Uh, and that way you'll be up to date with our events and also our adventures as trainees here at the Freshwater Habitat Trust. Um, and also on our project website, just coming on the chat too, um, you'll find loads of info about Grow Wet and the wider environmental work we do here in Oxfordshire. But if you still have any other questions, comments, suggestions, please email lovely Lizzie at the email address just provided on the chat and on the slide. And yeah, that is all from us. Uh, back to Lizzie and Andy. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, if you guys have got any questions about that, we are now going to go on to our question and answer session. So now will be the time to ask any questions that you have about the grow packs, about the project, and quiz about our knowledge about freshwater habitats and the plants that you're going to be receiving. So I see Thanks. that we've already got a few questions. Andy, would you like to see? Yeah, sure. So yeah, we've got a few coming in. So um, we'll just we're here um we'll be here what well, we've got about 15 minutes left so please uh fill up the question boxes and um yeah we can we can answer some questions we've got a few nice ones coming in um i think jeremy the first one is probably going to be for you uh so <laughs> i'll just read that one out uh so this is from richard uh given the fact that thames water one of the worst polluters of our uh fresh waterways in the area how do you engage with them to try and encourage better practices? Are you aware of Windrush against sewage pollution and do you engage with them? Can I, can I speak the answers? Or do you want me to write them out? Oh, no, please speak them. Oh, yeah, good. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'd, yeah, much, I'd much rather answer yeah, yeah, Sorry. And I, was so, pity I can't talk to Richard directly. I'm sure Richard can hear me, but he can't speak back, can he, sadly? Um, so. Uh, how do we engage with Thames Water? Well, um, Thames Water have helped our concept. They, they not not very well noticed by people is that Thames Water have been supporting our work for actually thirty years, um, and that's been really important because it's helped completely change the way we think about fresh water. Um, one of our very first, the very first project we did back in the nineteen nineties was beginning the creation of Pink Hill Meadow, and that's on Thames Water's Thames Water site, and they've. Uh, helped fund that and they've run a, a recently over the last few years they've actually had paid for a site manager there and although that's only one site it may not seem all that important it is physically a relatively small area it's actually been really important in changing people's understanding of the importance of small water bodies generally and that's becoming kind of a, certainly I would say it's a Europe-wide movement 
and it's perhaps no exaggeration to say it's actually a worldwide movement that we've begun to realize that it's not just the biggest waters that are important, it, as important as they are. I'll come back to the other parts of the question in a moment. But those small waters are actually the place where we see most freshwater wildlife when we look across whole landscapes. And I, I would like to say that they have been, well, and, and to be fair, they have been supporting that work for many years and helping it along. And they're helping quite a bit of the, um, a bit of the work that we're doing in uh, building oxygen's freshwater network as well. Now, though, to come to your the the more, the more uh, pointy questions here about sewage. Well, of course, yes, I, I'm aware. I do know the guys in Windrush Windrush against sewage pollution, and they're doing a great job because it is terrible the amount of pollution that's going into our rivers from sewage where it's overflowing. And you're right, they are one of the worst polluters of our fresh waters. Well, they're one of the worst polluters of the river network. Um, at their, and they're not unusual in that. All water companies are in the same boat. And um, to a degree, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to underplay it because it's important. They're not the only cause of pollution of rivers. They're roughly very crudely, it's 50-50 sewage and land use and urban areas and farming. So we've got a big problem to tackle river pollution. It's really intractable. It happens all over Western Europe, all over the developed world. Um, but we do need to do better somehow. And our problem is that we all use a lot of water. We all have this system of dispersing our, <coughs> excuse me, dispersing our waste with water, sending it down the toilet and out to a sewage works, and then hoping that the water companies will do a good job fixing that. And actually, Collectively, our treatment of water by sewage, our sewage treatment just isn't that great, to be honest. And we recommend, I mean, our, our aim is to try and get sewage works taken off of rivers completely, because even if you stop the sewage overflows, there'll still be the, the treat, so-called treated sewage effluent still has a big impact on rivers, even if it's not raw. Um, and for us, we would we would advocate simply the closing of sewage works and moving it, moving this the waste away from as many rivers as we can to get as many rivers as we, can, as we can in as good a condition as we can. And then, to be honest, we're probably going to have to suck it up in some places because our system is completely failing. I mean, it's just a, our infrastructure is just hopeless at managing water. Um, so. You're right, they're one of the worst polluters. They're not the only worst polluter. The other worst polluters are the people who use the land, the people who live in houses and have over, run off from urban areas. Um, it, it's a really tr tricky problem. And that's part of why we're talking about the freshwater network, because we think we should be trying to protect as much of the water environment as possible. And there are some easier wins with other parts of the environment than simply going at the sewage works. We should do that, but it's a very, very difficult problem. And there's lots of other stuff we can do as well not least making our floodplains much more natural. So I would focus on river floodplain work a lot, as well as focusing what's in the channel as well. I'm very conscious of being this being a one-way conversation. I, I don't like one-way conversations, because it's not really fair. Anyway, I'll shut up now, I'll have my say. Thanks, Jeremy. I mean, Richard, if you could um, just write in the um, box as to whether that's, uh, yeah, thanks, Jeremy, he said, so hopefully that's answered that for him. Um, brilliant. So we've got other questions here. So um, we've got one question that says, probably again directed at either Jeremy or David. So how will you work with the government's 25 year, year environment plan, particularly the natural capital, and will you collaborate with others? Shall I go? I'll do that briefly because we have we we do a lot of. Uh, I'll keep it brief so everyone else can have a turn because this so we get onto the plants for, for real. Uh, the twenty five year environment plan. There's um, uh, uh, lots of the environmental organisations work together to try and engage with this to try and lobby on it particularly to try and get it to say the right thing. And actually, the water part of the environment plan is really worrying because. Uh, the water targets are pretty rubbish, to be honest with you. And most of the people in environmental NGOs who care about water think they're rubbish because they're not focusing enough on the quality of the rivers or the lakes or the ponds. They're too focused on uh, things to do with what we might do to try and change that. So how much farmland isn't going to be intensive? How much sewage effluent is going to be running into rivers? We're going to be measuring that and setting targets on that rather than on the actual condition of the rivers. And we really hope that can be changed. Um, and 
so we're campaigning a bit on that, campaigning, lobbying a bit on that with our colleagues as much as we can. And will we collaborate with those others? Absolutely. The whole freshwater network thing, I didn't really, you know, in, in 10 minutes, we can only give a very superficial introduction to it. And there will be a bigger introduction to the project later in the year so that people can get more of that. We will be absolutely doing that in partnership. I mean, the Oxford's work is a bit of a microcosm of that in that we've got lots of partners, but really this is a concept that only works as a partnership with lots of other people, some working directly with us, others working at arm's length. And we just say, you know, try and do it like this and, and go for it, guys, uh, because it's such a big job and it's such a big, uh, such a big goal. Thanks very much, Jeremy. That's great. Um, okay, on to the next one. So more plant focused this one. Uh, so how much space do we need to grow a plant? Can they be grown indoors? Um, Paula, are you happy to take that one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, good question. Um, so basically, you can have as little space as a windowsill. That'll be great for us. Um, and yeah, indoors is great. Uh, if you don't have a garden, indoors is also like great information for us to see how they uh, develop indoors. So yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> uh, so yeah, indoors is fine on a windowsill. Um, best place for them is probably outside um, on a in your garden or on your patio. Um, but yeah, we are opening this up to everybody. So it's again, as Paula said, it's an experiment. So we'll see see how what works and what doesn't. So another question is, what if we don't live in Oxford? Okay, actually, I think um, this one can probably be passed to Evie. Are you happy to answer this one? I can answer this one. Um, I'm afraid that because this is the first year we're doing the project, this is only going to be Oxford based for this time. Um, we're hoping that in the coming years, if this year is successful, we can expand it to other areas of the country, as um, I think Jeremy said earlier, to neighbouring counties and then um, further afield. But um, sadly, for things mainly logistics, um, it's only going to be Oxfordshire based this time, I'm afraid. But thank you so much for um, listening in today. If you know anybody in Oxford who will be interested, please spread the word and um, and yeah, keep an eye out for future opportunities um, in further out from Oxford. Okay, thanks, Evie. Um, yeah, just it is just worth emphasising that if if I'm not sure where um, Molly is from, if it, if you're if you're in Oxfordshire, you can be almost anywhere, though. It doesn't, if you're in Oxfordshire, it's fine. It doesn't have to be just Oxford then. But if you're in other parts of the country, like you said, Evie, then, then it's, we're not really, we can't support it at the moment. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified. Oxfordshire is fine. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. Brilliant. Um, so we've got another nice question here. So uh, this will be one for you, David, I think. Uh, where is the best place to see... Uh, Carnivorous plants in Oxfordshire, uh, and do you hope to re release these elsewhere? Uh, the best place, um, well, they do need really clean water, so there's not very many places where they are left. Um, maybe the best display is of the bladderwort at Otmore, which is really easy to see if you go to the RSPB reserve. They flower very regularly in the ditches there next to the main walkway, the main footpath from the car park to the to the hide where you can go and see the starlings. They put on a pretty good display. They're easy to see. Um, there's also the Butterworts at the Lye Valley um, is also a good one. Um, uh, our other, our third carnivorous plant, or oh, fourth is one of them is extinct, so you can't see that anymore. So maybe I would say Otmore. That's probably the easiest one to find. Um, the place where the Butterwort grows is quite a delicate habitat. So um, not, not necessarily the best place to go to. So yeah, I would recommend Otmore. Great, thank you very, very much for that, David. So we have another question from Marion. Hi, Marion, who is saying, Where, we are planning to grow our plants at Boundary Brook Nature Park rather than taking them home. How frequently do you think we'll need to visit to ensure that the plants are adequately nurtured? So David, that's probably another one for you too, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> if you're one of those scientists 
uh, answers of it depends. Um, maybe like once a week, but it's going to depend on the growing conditions and how shady your place is as to how much water is lost from the pots. Um, we'll be giving you little trays to sit the water in, to sit the plants in water in. Um, so it sort of just depends on how the season develops, really. But I would say sort of once a week would be a sort of rough minimum. Um, yeah, it's mainly about the watering. Great. Thanks again, David. Uh, OK, so the next question. Um, this, is, this is an interesting question, this one. I like it. Um, do you expect any invertebrates to lay eggs on these water plants? Um, very interesting project. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested in reading any reports from your findings. So it's kind of more of a comment, um, but there is a, an aspect of a question there. If, if Who would like to take that one? Shall I do that one, Andy? Yes. <laughs> With the short answer is yes, I'm sure they will do. I'm sure invertebrates will lay eggs on these water plants, definitely. Um, I mean, the ones both in, in the water and out of the water, I, my knowledge would be best on the on the things that live in the water, but things that live, that, but invertebrates that uh, are t you might know, think of as terrestrial will be, will be using them as well. Um, it's quite difficult to say. I mean, there'll be a whole range of species that might be laying their eggs on them. So you might see damselflies laying eggs on the in the tissues of the submerged water plants like the like the bladderwort, the underwater roots of things like the siam would probably have could have uh, water beetles or again dragonflies and damselflies laying their eggs on them. And I guess there'll be a whole bunch of terrestrial animals uh, putting laying their eggs to in the in the stems of some of the of the emergent out of the water parts of some of these plants as well and as i'm a freshwater biologist i don't know so much about those at all but i think they there will be a whole load of things using them but the only thing i would add is as well that that invertebrates using aquatic plants they they often use them a bit non-specifically so there's not like a, it's not like with it's not the same as with um moths and butterflies where there are very specific uh, connections between individual species and different kinds of plants that doesn't seem to happen quite so much under the water i was just going to say that that's an opportunity for using the diary that we'll provide to record those kinds of observations obviously it's pretty difficult for scientists to observe those plant animal interactions in the wild so there's a bit of an opportunity to record something that's potentially interesting Brilliant. Thanks for those responses. So <clears throat> another one um, that's probably either for yeah Jeremy or David is, have you identified the areas where the nursery plants will be transplanted to? And do you envisage engaging volunteers to help plant them? Uh, the answer to the first part of that question is partly talking to other conservation organisations in the area to see to see where we might put them, though we've got some options. So, for example, RSPB Upmore is is a potential option. There are some sites around Oxford where we're already working on. So some of the pictures that I showed you, the Greater Water Parsnip, we could put plants there. Um, yeah, so yeah, we have things in the pipeline and definitely volunteers can help to plant them. We haven't planned those sessions as we don't know where they're going yet and how many plants we'll put there and what the potential number of volunteers that we'll need to help them, help, help us to do that. But certainly, yes, yeah, volunteers will be involved in in that endpoint. Great, thanks very much, guys. Um, yeah, we are. We're at uh, half past eight now, so I, th I think we will draw it, draw things to a to a close, and we'll stop the questions. Um, there is a couple of a few remaining questions, but we can we'll respond to those um, after the session. Um, and also, if anybody's got any more questions they want to ask us, then please do just get in touch. We're all very open to chat about this. As, as we said before, we're very excited to be working on this project and always happy to chat, grow wet and the wider project. So yeah, just um, to say thank you very much to, to um, all of you for participating. Thank you so much to um, all the panelists as well for the excellent talks. Um, and just to remind you, uh, the next step will be to receive your plants or come to one of our events that we'll be holding. So. Plants should be with you uh, late May and throughout June. 
Um, so we'll we'll be in touch with you about that when we're when we'll be running around crazy delivering them everywhere, uh, which should be a very interesting logistical challenge, but nicely summarized in the presentation, I thought. Uh, so great. Um, yeah, and there's there's also other ways you can get involved in in the work that we're doing. So for example, you could come and volunteer at one of our Fen sites. We've got monthly volunteer work parties at Hinksy Heights Fen, uh, just outside of Oxford. Um, always welcoming new volunteers, so please do just get in touch if if you're interested in that. Um, and as we said, keep an eye on our web page, our social media, and Eventbrite. Um, all of our events will be uploaded onto there. There is events coming up, as Paula said, at the weekend. So please do come along and say hello to us. And over to you, Lizzie. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Andy. So as Andy said, yeah, please, please do follow us on socials. It'd be really lovely. We've got a Facebook page at the moment and an Instagram platform. And we're really hoping to open this up to everybody to kind of create a lovely little community vibe where you can all share your tips and tricks for growing your plants and see what's working and um, chat to us as well. We'll be in there to answer your questions on Facebook and Instagram. Um, it's a really great way as well to keep up to date with what's going on with our project um, and the up and coming events, such as the one this weekend at Boundary Brook and um, Lawrence Park um, Community Centre. Um, yeah again please get everybody to sign up if they live in Oxfordshire um so your friends and family everybody's welcome to join we we've got loads and loads of plants ready to hand out to people I don't think we can have too many volunteers at the moment so that's brilliant um and yeah thank you all so so much for joining us tonight and we very much look forward to hopefully meeting you in person at some of these events and to hearing about all of your amazing growing experiences So that will be a good pie from us, I think. And yeah, we'll answer all your questions, um, hopefully after the webinar, probably tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <clears throat> and bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank bye. you. Thank you.